Gary Heidnick has been charged with multiple counts of rape and kidnapping after allegedly keeping three women in prison in his basement. Self-proclaimed bishop Gary Heidnick was a serial killer on a mission. His plan is to kidnap these women, keep them in the basement, and impregnate them. Detectives found body parts in pots on the stove and in a freezer. They realized just how sadistic he can get. Everything began to smell like death. All of his victims were women. They were extremely vulnerable to people like Gary. Another body was found outside the city. And if it weren't for one young woman, who knows how high the body count would have been. One survivor had to not only put up with horrible abuse and torture, but fight through it, develop a plan, and help lead to the rescue of the other women. Anytime that you're cut off from the world outside, and, and whoever's holding you captive, the same person after a period of time, you're going to grow to like him because he's your only source of survival. And psychologically, you know this. You know, you know that this is the person that's got to bring you bread and water. And he just created his own little world in his basement. And everybody just kind of pretty much dealt with it, I guess, in their own way. How often do you think of the basement? It's not something I dwell on every day. You know, it's something that's a part of me that I'm never going to forget. It's very therapeutic to talk about it because the more I talk about it, it's just not sitting in my brain, festering. I grew up in Philadelphia in a foster home. I was truly blessed with my foster parents. I had everything that I wanted. We went everywhere. We had every toy that was out. I did have a loving home. I graduated from high school. I ended up going to college and getting an associate's degree in accounting. In 1980, I was 19 years old when I had my oldest daughter, Latoya. My mother and my father initially lived in my grandmother's house. When she left my father, she moved back with her mother, where she gave birth, and I was with my mother there until I was about three. This is me when I was three. This is a photo of my mom. Not sure how old she is, but I thought we looked similar. My mother was awesome. She was a great mother. I remember her happy and doing my hair and taking me places. She was like my favorite person in the whole world. For Josefina's three-year-old daughter, this is just life as she knows it. But what she's not aware of is that her mom has been battling drug addictions her whole life. I kind of got sidetracked. When people have everything in the world they want, it, it starts to go in a different direction because you just want to be around something different. I smoked weed in the beginning, but then I moved on to powder, cocaine, and then crack hit the market. The effect of the drug makes you think you want more and more, even if you don't want more and more. In the mid-1980s, Josefina has one more daughter, Zorne, and a son, Ricky. But she's still battling addiction, and she loses custody of her three kids. The judge told Josefina that to get custody of her children back, she needed to find a stable job and a place to live. Because of her financial struggles, she resorted to prostitution. She was trying to just get money to get an apartment so that she can get us back. I don't think that her vision for her life was to be a prostitute or to be on drugs or to not have her children. I just think that that was where circumstances took her. I don't think I'm regretful for any part of my life. But, you know, working on the street, selling drugs on the street, anything that you're doing is not right. It's coming with some consequences eventually. Murder, kidnapping, and rape charges have been lodged against 43-year-old Gary Heidnick, a self-styled preacher with a criminal record. Police say he lured six women to his home where they were bound in a basement torture chamber. Police found parts of her body frozen in his refrigerator. 
Josefina met Gary Heidnick the night before Thanksgiving in 1986. I went out just to make some money. It was chilly, so I didn't intend on being out there that long. I was walking down Gerard Avenue, going towards Front Street. Somebody pulled me over at 2nd and Gerard. He pulls up in a Cadillac. Driver was white, big. He had a beard. He had on a brown jacket with some kind of fringe on the sleeves. He offered me money to go back to his house. And I was telling him about my objections about that. I never went back to people's houses. He was like, well, I'm just too tall to do anything in the car. So I just went along with it. Why are you breaking your own rule? I broke my own rule because it wasn't a lot of traffic outside, and he was too tall for his car. So it was just, you know. He introduced himself as Gary. Gary takes Josephina to his home, which is in northern Philadelphia on Marshall Street. When he got to the door, it was two locks. The door lock was a two-way lock. The top lock was a two -way. Yeah, you needed the key to get out, the key to get in. We went upstairs to his bedroom. We took our clothes off. You know, we had sex, and then when I got up to get dressed, he came up behind me and started choking me. And the only thing I can remember was like a, a broken film clip where it's like click, 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 you know, of things that went on in my life. Going back over years and years and years. And I remember I kept yelling and screaming. He was like, if you stop struggling, I'm not gonna keep choking you. Just put your other hand behind your back. And I did, and he put the handcuffs on. From the second floor, Gary pushes Josefina down another flight of stairs to the basement. The basement has the mattress, along with this dirt hole in the floor. I said to myself, is this guy going to bury me here? I was scared. I thought, what is going on here? And how did I get myself here? So he sits me down on this little mattress that he had down there in the basement. He's putting on these muffler clamps with screws and using crazy glue to, to tighten them. And the chain is connected to the water pipes. Then he took the handcuffs off. My hands are free, but my ankles are not. I couldn't understand nothing that was going on. Gary never said anything. He wasn't in a panic at all. He was prepared. And then he put me inside the hole. I was buried alive. He kept trying to fit me in this hole, and he kept taking his board, and he kept slamming it on my head, you know, trying to get me to fit into this hole. I was buried alive for 18, 20, 20 hours, maybe more. I knew it was Thanksgiving because of the radio in the basement. It's pitch black. I can't see anything. I could not tell whether it was daytime or nighttime because there was no light. The basement sat on the ground. I'm, like, trying to figure out what his intentions is. I was screaming and screaming. And then he came downstairs and took the board off. And pulled me out of the hole by my hair, and he had this stick, and he just started beating me and beating me, beating me. And then he put me back in the hole. Josephina's trapped in this nightmare. Gary's depriving her of food and water, and now he's only returning to the basement to rape her. And in the meantime, you know, your body is still going to want to still continue to get hot. I'm just sitting there losing my mind. After she's been down there a few days, Gary starts to talk to her. Is he acting like a crazy person? Is he raving and raving? No. No, he's not acting crazy at all. And I don't think he thought he was crazy. He would just talk about, you know, what was going on with him. A lot of people think that when you're insane, you you're swallowing your tongue, you're whacking your head against the wall, and in some cases, that's true. But Gary Heidnick was very smart. He had 148 IQ. When he was 17, Gary dropped out of high school and decided to join the Army, but he only ended up serving 13 months. The Army said he was schizophrenic. They discharged him and gave him 100% disability and an honorable discharge. After this, he collects checks from the Army as a result of this discharge. 
and she learns that he has used this money in the stock market. Gary Heidnick had some ridiculous amount of money in the stock market, driving a Rolls Royce, a brand new Cadillac. I mean, this guy had money. But he, he did not live a lavish lifestyle, except for the cars. He claimed he was a bishop for the church he ran out of his home, the same home where he held Josephina captive. Gary's church attracted congregants, many of whom suffered from some kind of mental disability. Gary would help some of the mentally infirm in front of all the neighbors so that they would see and spread the word. He ordained himself as a bishop in this church and was able to perform church services with some credibility. And along with the church came this tax benefit. He wrote off everything, and that's how he accumulated wealth. Then Gary tells Josephina why he kidnapped her and is holding her captive. He said he had three kids and that child services took every one of them. So his plan was to kidnap as many girls as possible just to bear kids. His goal was to get them pregnant in his basement to raise a perfect race. They were going to be half black, half white. They weren't going to have outside influence from the world. That doesn't even make any sense. I'm not black, I'm Puerto Rican. It was just so crazy. He said, if I got pregnant, I would have the baby down there. And if there was any complications, you just suffer and die. <laughs> After revealing his plan, Gary leaves her alone in the basement. I was thinking, let me see if I can get these muscle clamps off. Josephina is able to free one of her ankles from the shackles. The chain was long enough for me to walk around the basement. I was like, well, let me see what's here. I found a little cross space underneath this kitchen. I could see sunlight, I could feel air, so I knew it had to be a way out. This crawl space leads to a vent, which leads outside just above the basement. She's not able to get all the way out, though. It was daytime. I can't tell you what time of day it was, but there was a zillion people outside. I could hear everybody talking from where I was. There was so many people out here the day that I was out here hollering and screaming. I hollered in Spanish, English, nobody answered. I knew they heard, they had to have heard me. Eventually, someone does hear her cries for help, but it's not who she's hoping for. All of a sudden, I feel Gary pulling the chain from the inside. He kept pulling it, and I'm still hollering, and still nobody's answering me. And he's like really pulling this chain to a point where it's going to break my ankle. So finally, I just let him pull me through. There was really nothing I could do. When he pulled me back through there, he was just so livid. Of course, he beat me, put me back in a hole. Gary continues the cycle of feeding her, assaulting her, feeding her, assaulting her, and it's just a nightmare. When he would take the handcuffs off, I couldn't even, like, move my arms because they had been pasted behind me for so long. On day seven, Josefina hears Gary and another person coming down the stairs. I could hear this girl crying and crying and crying. He says, this is Sandra. I know Sandra for years, so I don't know why she's crying, but y'all might as well get to know each other because you're going to be here for a while. Gary's new captive is Sandra Lindsay. She's 24 years old. She is chained to the same pipe that Josephina is. Sandra was like my information point because she knew him. So I would just grill her, asking her all these different questions, trying to get to know who this man was in order to try to get myself out of there. Sandra Lindsay had met him at a psychiatric hospital that she had been staying at Sandra struggled with mental disabilities. She had gone to his church previously and had gotten to know him there. Sandra said that they went to the movies, and then he came back and they had sex, and he ended up choking her. She was upset we both were. I mean, we're both chained in a situation in a hole on a mattress in a basement. It was a mess. 
Now he's trying to get us both pregnant. My concern was getting out of there, because I knew nobody knew where I was. Her family, given her struggles with addiction and her prostitution work, it's not completely out of the norm that they wouldn't hear from her for a while. While no one had been looking for Josephina, Sandra's mom and sister were really worried when they hadn't seen or spoken to her in days. Sandra's mother and sister would come to the house all the time, and we would hear banging on the door. He would put us down in the hole and cover the board. There was a blast of blurring radio on the basement. There was another radio on the first floor. So it was blasting all the time. We couldn't scream for help. So you would have just been howling to be howling. When a week passes and Sandra is still missing, her family files a missing persons report. Her mother and sister go to the police and say, we know that she's got something to do with Gary Heidnick. They knew that Sandra would attend church services on the first floor of Gary Heidnick's house. I bet she's in there. The Philadelphia police respond to the missing persons report and send an officer to Gary's home. Me and Sandra could hear banging on the door. We can hear Gary open the door. The Philadelphia police officer questions Gary, asking if he's seen Sandra Lindsay. Gary says he hasn't heard from her. He doesn't know. Given that she was an adult and that there was no real probable cause, the police didn't look into it any further. We still trapped in the basement, and nobody could hear us. It was difficult for the girls to even know what month it was, let alone what week it was. But with the radio that was really used to drown out noises in, in, from the outside. Once Christmas music started getting mixed in there, they knew it had to be December. Josephine has been a prisoner in Gary's basement for almost a month, and his number of captives continues to grow. The next girl down in the basement was Lisa Thomas. Lisa's 19. Apparently, she was on her way to the store, and she saw him in his car, I liked his car, and, you know, he stopped and pulled over. She got in, he took her shopping, took her to eat, and then brought her back to the house. Then he came up behind her and started choking her. The women are isolated and tortured on a daily basis, but with no one else to rely on, all three start forming a tight bond. We did as much as we could trying to comfort each other. We just sat around and talked about things like our kids. It's hard for me because my daughter's birthday was November 30th. Zornay's birthday was the second. I wasn't there for Thanksgiving. And then I didn't show up for Christmas. So my focus was on getting out of there. I remember overhearing the conversations that was being had regarding her not showing up for court dates. She missed a few visits. I think everyone just thought that it was the drugs, though. No one in my family knew. My mother was held hostage or anything that was going on with her. I just wanted to see her, you know? I just wanted her a part of my life. Gary returns home one night in the new year with another hostage, 23-year-old Deborah Dudley, who is also a sex worker. Deborah Dudley was always mouthing off and doing stuff that just aggravated him, and he just beat her so much. I think she might have had the hardest there. Nearly two months after Josephina is taken, Gary returns home with a fifth victim, 18-year-old Jacqueline Askins. And believe it or not, the women in this basement are about to enter an even darker chapter of their captivity. In early February, Sandra's not eating. Sandra's period stopped coming on, so he's assuming that she's pregnant, and he wants her to eat. Gary became infuriated, so he put her on punishment. And one of his punishments was to tie the hands above the head and just leave her there. She didn't have the strength to stand any longer, and she just collapsed. And when your hands are above your head like this and tied, your air passageways get cut off. It's a painful death, and she expired. And he sticks the key in there and just turns it, and the handcuff comes open, and she's like, damn, right to the ground. 
He thought Sandra was pregnant. And he's like, oh, that's a shame. Now I lost another baby. He just took her upstairs and closes the door. And we're all in the, in the basement. And we're like crying. Like, everybody's really upset. For the first month, me and Sandra were there by ourselves. In that situation, you know, trying to get each other through it. It really broke my heart when she died. Meanwhile, Deborah's incapable of falling in line, and she continues fighting with Gary. Deborah was trouble for Gary. She wanted to fight him every step of the way. So he would administer punishments to her. He took Deborah upstairs, and they were up there for a minute, and then he brought her back down. Something happened that upset her. It was like written all over her face. We was asking her what happened, and she was like, he had Sandra's head crooked in a pot and ribs in a roasting pan. And he told me if I didn't straighten up, that was going to happen to me. Gary's actions are so completely depraved to almost an incomprehensible level. It's not something you would describe as human. The four remaining women agree that they need a plan to escape Gary's basement. It's now or never. But Josefina knows they only have one chance to get this right. Deborah Dalia came up with this plan. When he comes down here, we could all jump him, and we could pretty much kill him. And I'm like, so how do we get out the basement then? Because he doesn't bring down the keys. We'd still be trapped in the basement because we had no way to get out, and nobody could hear us. We would have been stuck down here smelling a dead body with no food, no water. The only way out was through him. The next time Gary comes downstairs, Josephina tries to gain his trust. One of the ways that Josephina tries to build that trust is she tells Gary the plan. I say, Gary, they wanted to jump you downstairs and kill you so that they would be able to get out. And he said, well, you know I don't bring the keys with me. I said, yeah, I know. I, I kind of broke that down to him. Gary punishes the other women by forcing them into the hole. But this time, it's different. Lisa, Deborah, and Jackie are in the pit. He filled the pit with water, and he decides he's going to electrocute them. They're all in this pit, literally dug in the basement of this row house. And they're all chained together. And he would just simply take an electric cord, plugged into an outlet, and he would touch one girl with the metal, and it would go all the way around. And it was crazy painful. At this point, they screamed at the top of their lungs. They were in pain, and he's laughing. He thinks it's funny, and he's enjoying himself. And they realize just how sadistic he can get. We may be torturing the other girls. Never in my whole life did I think I was going to ever experience anything like that. It was just so crazy. After the second time, Jackie just started yelling, Deb was dead. Deborah Dudley was bent over. Her face was in the water. She was dead. He just picked her up and took her out and put her in the freezer. He says, now my basement will get back to having some peace. Now that I've gotten rid of her. When Deborah died, that had me like really so upset. It was so unbelievable to me. Looking back, there's nothing I would have done different in that situation, period. If you think I was right and you think I was wrong, you can't tell me that unless you've been in that same situation. He took the keys out of his pocket. He took the clamps and stuff off my feet and just told me to go upstairs. So I did, and I'm upstairs. I'm like, now I'm free, but I'm not free, because, you know, the house is surrounded with bars all on the windows. There's two-way locks on all the doors. The next day, it's clear to Josefina that Gary only removed her shackles because he needs her help. So Gary is going to get rid of Deborah Dudley's body. He needs help carrying the body. It's not necessarily a two-person job, but Gary felt that the more she helps him, the more she's going to be guilty. She's not going to turn on him because she's now a co-conspirator. And that was fine with her because her that's her, going to be her way out, is to be trusted. I've been locked up for four months. It would have brought me closer to freedom. So I said yes, and we just went on from there. And they go together to a heavily forested area in New Jersey called Pine Barrens.
I, I haven't been out here since. This happened when I was out here with Heineck. So I don't know how it's going to affect me. You know, we're just going to hope everything will be all right. It's an hour away from Gary's home in New Jersey. The soil in this heavily forested area is made up of mostly sand, so it's easy to dig up in the winter. That, coupled with its proximity to New York City and Philadelphia, have made it notorious for dumping bodies since the early 1960s. He drove down here and he turned up this little road. The road was so small you would have never seen it, so I'm sure he must have been there before. <laughs> Because I, you know, you wouldn't really, it's not noticeable from the street. I remember sitting in the car, it was dark. I remember hearing the plastic bag coming off her body. I heard uh, the boom of her body, frozen body, hitting the back of the trunk. And all I kept saying was, what does, my, what does he decide to dump my ass out here? It's scary, it's weird. I'm glad I didn't get left out here because I really thought he could have left me out here too. To be here with one of the per people that I wanted to get out that didn't make it. I wanted everybody to make it out. My whole intention was always make sure I was somewhere safe, the girls were safe. And he couldn't get back to me and I, he couldn't get back to these other girls, you know? I knew if I ran and I took off, he was going to kill him. He wasn't going to keep him. The next morning, Gary continues to assault Josefina, but he doesn't force her back into the basement. And the other women still held hostage noticed the special treatment. They thought I had joined his side. You know, that he had converted me to a life of evil crime. Can't nobody convert me to nothing. I'm never going to forget the fact that we got raped, tortured, abused, killed, and everything else. Josefina knows that Gary trusts her now. She decides to use his trust to make her big escape. He wants me to go with him to find another girl. So I said, OK, we can go find you another girl, but I want to go and see my family. And he said, OK, fine. I was. Just a show of shocked and amazed that he even went for it. And Josephina was a smart girl. She was no dummy. And little by little, she was gaining his trust. And, and it worked. Having made a deal with Gary, Josephina holds up her end of the bargain. She goes out driving with him in search of another woman to lock in the basement. I did not sign up for all this, but it was always my intent to make sure everybody got out safely. As they're driving slowly down Front Street, which isn't far from Josefina's apartment, she recognizes the working girl that Gary has his eyes on, 24-year-old Agnes Adams. Agnes Adams lived in the same area I did. I saw her before, but I never knew her, like who she was, what her name was, or nothing like that. When he pulled up in the car, she knew him. She's like, oh my god, Gary, you here. They go back to Gary's house. They have sex. And next thing you know, Agnes Adams finds herself chained up in the basement. The other girls were quick to tell Agnes Adams that Josephine is in on it. Be careful what you say to her. She's not one of us. Don't trust her. Agnes Adams is freaking out. But Josephine is doing this to gain Gary's trust. And after four months of being held captive, Gary finally agrees to let Josephina see her family. And we get to Six and Gerard. My heart is beating hard because I'm like almost there, but I'm not there. There's like a gas station on the corner. I said, I can't take you with me because I've been going way too long. I said, I'm, they're going to have a whole lot of questions and I don't want them to ju um, jump on you. I said, you can go and get some coffee and drink it. And I should be back in 10 or 20 minutes. And he said, OK. Gary Hardick was parked here. I proceeded to go down 6th Street, which I was like really fearful because I thought, he was going to get out of the car and follow me, or, you know, my heart was pounding because now I'm, like, literally free, but I'm not free. Josefina spots a payphone two blocks away. I called 911. The dispatcher answered. I said, look, I've been held captive for over, like, four months. The guy has other girls chained in the basement. 
I said, I need somebody to come out here now, because if he thinks I'm not coming back, he's going to go kill these other girls. I came back around and stood at the corner so I could see Gary if he pulled out the gas station. And I stood there and waited. It just really tripped me up. I was a police officer working for the city of Philadelphia. We responded to a radio call in reference to a female being held captive. We met Josephina. She was very upset, and she went on to tell a bizarre story. You know, it was tough to believe. I asked her if she was a hooker, and she said she was. And they said, what? What, you getting a fight with your pimp or something? It, it was crazy because the cops did not believe me, and I couldn't understand that. It was as bad as me sitting in the back of Gary Heinick's house. With having 15 years of police experience, people have a tendency to lie, to elaborate. I asked her, lift up your pant leg. If you're chained up for you know, four months, there's going to be some kind of abrasion. And she did. I noticed chafing and bruising on her left ankle. And I said, this is for real. An officer arrives to wait with Josefina while Officer Savage looks for Gary Heidnick. Once we got down to Six and Gerard, I observed a, a silver over white Cadillac, which Josefina said he'd be in. And he was sitting behind the steering wheel, engine running. I pulled up directly behind the vehicle so he couldn't back out. I observed a male with a beard and a cowboy jacket with fringe on it. I said, you know, that looks like him. And I approached uh, the male with my weapon, and I ordered him to turn the car off. I said, exit the vehicle. Gary wasn't nervous. He was uh, cooperative. He kept asking me, what's this about? I said, it's about rape, kidnapping, and possibly two counts of murder. He clammed up. Didn't say anything. He just stood there. We handcuffed him. So they took me over to see Gary, to identify Gary in the back of the paddy wagon. I told him, yep, that was him. And they closed the paddy wagon doors. He had a look on his face that was just priceless. Like, I really should have got rid of this Priceless. <laughs> that look was priceless. <laughs> it was finally over. You know, I didn't have to worry about the girls getting killed. Within hours, warrants are obtained and police descend upon Gary's home on Marshall Drive. I was the third person through that door. The radios were blasting, the TVs were turned on with, with no picture. Everything began to smell like death. Uh, if you ever smelt death, you'll never forget it. It strangles you. I went right to the basement. It was pitch black, I had a flashlight. The hair on my arms were standing up. Coming across this scene was something that I'll never forget. It was dirt walls. Chains went to a soil pipe, shackled to the, the women's ankles. When I first observed the, the girls on the mattress, they were sleeping. I pointed the flashlight in their direction, and they jumped up. They were hysterical, and we kept yelling, police, police, and they started hugging one another. You know, and they kept screaming, we're saved, we're saved. And then they pointed to the back, and they said, she's in there. Agnes came out of that hole, and she was just thrilled to be able to stand up. It was emotional. Then I heard somebody say, this is now a homicide investigation. There was body parts found in the kitchen freezer. It was one of the most sickening crime scenes I ever been involved in. I thought to myself, Jesus, what would have happened if we blew Josephine off? In March 25th, I was finally freed. The girls were finally freed, and Heineck was behind bars where he should be. It took me a long time, but I realized the reason why God had me there was to save the other girls. Josefina leads a police search team to the Pine Barrens the next day to recover Deborah Dudley's body. And I don't know how I found that little road, but I found it. 
and they found you right away. And I was just like, oh my God, please rest in peace, Deborah. You know, rest in peace. After learning that there was two murders that transpired, I, I said, yeah, that guy probably would have killed them all. I remember going to see her in the hospital. I was six. They just said that they found her, that she wanted to see me. I asked her what happened. I can't remember her answer. Um, I just remember crying in her arms. The scene is a house of horror in Philadelphia. It becomes a huge media storm. Reporters from all over descend on this Philadelphia neighborhood that is not used to this kind of attention. Police say the three women who were rescued were found chained to the basement floor. Now remember, we're like looking at the news. I didn't realize it was as giant as it was. Three women were found chained in the basement. Philadelphia police carried out boxes and bags of body parts found in a refrigerator. Neighbors are in shock. Media members are in shock. The country's in shock. He just um, put handcuffs on me. He raped me. He did? He what, raped. Did he, what did he do to the other one? He raped him and he beat them. He dug screwdrivers in our ears for a force not to hear him. We didn't take any baths. We didn't comb our hair, right? We spent most of the time in a hole. April of 1987, I was in Lancaster trying a homicide. And my secretary kept calling me up and saying, this guy who's all over the news wants you to represent him. Gary would always stress that all he was trying to do was get 10 women pregnant, and they brought these punishments onto themselves. Gary didn't want me to raise a mental deficiency case. And I said, what other defense is there? Are you going to say, I didn't know those girls were downstairs in my basement? He had been to prison before. He was convicted of kidnapping, false in prison, but no rape, no sexual assault, and got some sweetheart plea deal for two and a half to five. But in this case, he could be executed. So we had to win it all, not guilty by reason of insanity. On June 20th, 1988, the trial begins, and Josephina is a key witness. And Josephina talked about Gary's plotting, his lucid thoughts his cultivating Josefina Rivera to have a baby with him. He thought that the jury was going to find him not guilty by reason of insanity. But I knew in my heart of hearts there was no way 12 people were going to unanimously say not guilty by reason of insanity. The evidence was overwhelming that the defendant was evil and not legally insane, because juries believe you have to be going like this to be insane. The jury deliberates on Gary's defense for four days, but ultimately, they reject it. He's convicted of first-degree murder, rape, and kidnapping. In this case, I believe uh, Gary deserved what he got, and that was the death sentence. This date was July 6, 1999, when they finally executed Gary Heineck in Philadelphia I thought he should have stayed in a cell. Would have been more punishable to me. In the years following Heidnick's sentencing and death, Josefina falls into her old ways. How'd you survive? Um, it was hard. I did a lot of drugs. In the beginning, I could be going all these years like this, and it could be one thing that could send me tumbling back. But then eventually, I didn't want to solve my problem with drugs. I just wanted to be able to deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm at peace now because it's been so long, and you know, through therapy and psychiatrists and stuff like that, I've become better. Since the ordeal in Gary Heidnick's basement, she has repaired the relationship with her oldest daughter, Latoya, who she now has a meaningful relationship with. Even though she still struggled for so long, she was determined to be a mother to me. She was determined to be a great grandmother. She was determined to be an example. 20 years after escaping the basement, Josefina marries her boyfriend, Chris. This is my wife, Josefina. <laughs> Smart, she's beautiful, she's funny. Loving my life. She even reunites with her two youngest children, Ricky and Zornay. 
As she now is in a new phase of her life, Josefina has now a family that she can call her legacy. If she did not have the drive and the tenacity and the ability to see her way through that situation, I may have lost my mom in that basement. I could have never seen her again. When I look at you, even in this moment, even in this moment, <laughs> I didn't want to cry, but even in this moment, I'm so glad you're here. I go, and I'm so glad I'm here too. You know, it's something that's a part of me that I'm never going to forget. I love you so much. Then I just keep pushing forward, because it will get better, and it gets easier every day to go by. There is a serial killer operating right in their backyard. I said, oh my god, Mom, I dated him. I'm thinking, how am I going to get away from this person? There were times where I woke up and never remembered falling asleep. 40 years ago, I thought I was going to die here. <laughs> 